Dr. Daniel Griffin. Hi, I'm Dixon DePompe. Welcome to Chapter 3, Urinary Tract Infections. Whoa. So this, I must say, I find a very interesting topic. I do too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are lots of new revelations about the human microbiome that relate very much to this topic. Yes. Urinary tract infections, as we were talking with some of the, the Howdy Partners people who've helped us produce these um, videos, is that this has become a more challenging topic um, for clinicians throughout the world. Um, the first thing I think which is a critical point is the patients who come in with urinary discomfort is number one, not all reports of urinary discomfort are urinary tract infections. That's also very interesting. So that's number one very concentrated urine, perhaps in a dehydrated individual, yeah. can cause discomfort and be sure. quite irritating. Sure. You can have inflammation or urethritis due to sexually transmitted pathogens. Um, so when we're trying to make this- Or trauma. Or trauma. Sorry, interrupt. But no, no, trauma. I think that's, you can have trauma, you can have discomfort or dryness in that area that's being viewed or perceived right. as, right. Um, uh, exactly, exactly. So, Referred pain. So I think one of the important things is you're, you're going to need, and we're going to bring this up in several things, sometimes you're actually going to need a little bit of technology when possible to help you, or you may end up over-treating. Um, so one of the things we'll come back to is urine test strips, which are very inexpensive, wow. relatively. Yeah. Um, I would say significantly less costly than over-treatment with antibiotics of people who don't have urinary tract infections. Right. So I, I think I'm going to also throw that as sort of our introduction primary pearls is that one of the really critical bits of technology to try to have in these settings and make use of is the urine dipstick test. Which sounds easy to carry with you no matter where you are. Um, they really are. And one of the nice things is they don't require a machine. Right. Uh, most of the urine dipstick um, strips have a canister and there's an interpretation on the canister. It even tells you how long to wait before you read them. Right. It gets dipped in the urine and then you wait a certain amount of time yep. and you're looking for colors and your colors are telling you different things. True. It might be telling you about the pH of the urine. It might be telling you how concentrated the urine, which is going to be helpful. Yeah. Um, concentrated urine, as mentioned, is irritating in and of itself. It might tell you whether or not there are activated white cells, uh, something called leukesterase. Uh, might tell you about nitrites, which are produced by bacteria. Um, so there, there's, it might tell you about blood, might detect blood in the urine, which might um, suggest something else. Right? Exactly. What, what can you think of oh, as well, a parasitologist? <laughs> <laughs> I believe I could come up with at least one. <laughs> um, schistosoma hematobium is the first thing that pops into my mind, but I'm sure that's what you were prompting That's where I was prompting. Say. I was prompting with that. <laughs> right. Also, I think there was a, an era of education where um, we were taught the seven sterile fluids of the body. And that is obviously no longer the case. I mean, we used to memorize each of those areas like uh, cerebrospinal fluid and blood, urine, lymph, uh, Cochlear fluid in the inner ear, um, the region of aqueous, vitreous, yeah, the vitreous, <clears throat> the vitreous and aqueous humor, all of those areas, and that's all going out the window now that we've learned how to detect organisms that you can't culture. They're everywhere, basically. We mm -hmm. are a living zoo of microbial life, which serves the purpose of keeping us healthy. So sometimes things get out of control. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's what you're going to tell us. Well, I think that's, that's critical in our understanding is that um, it's very easy to over-treat people who come in with urinary discomfort and say, oh, um, and, and I think clinicians, there's almost a, an enjoyment because you're like, oh, now I know what it is. Exactly. Now I know what to do. Exactly. But that doesn't help if what you think you're doing is wrong. <laughs> Um, Correct. I will say one <laughs> is a large number of people with urinary discomfort, if they increase fluids, even if there was an increased bacterial load, most people will get better. Um, the human, human race did not go away um, in the prebiotic era. We, we survived up until then without That's right. antibiotics. That's right. Um, 
women get more urinary tract infections than men, and, and women did not all die off. They no. increased their fluids. They, they often resolved without antibiotics. Yeah. Um, I think that's really helpful, because that brings up um, a really important distinction that I want to raise, is the distinction between a simple urinary tract infection, right. so simple cystitis, yes. um, versus, I'll say, a more serious, a systemic urinary tract infection, uh -huh pyelonephritis, mm. uh, an infection associated with fever, right. elevated white blood cell count, if you have the yep. ability to do a complete blood count, sure. um, pain in the flanks, in the areas where the kidneys are, um, because those are not going to resolve and those can lead to a person becoming quite ill right. and about one in five people will end up with the bacteria actually getting into the blood. So these can be quite All right. serious infections. And the distinction of looking for those um, concerning warning signs is really yes. important early on when someone says, I have this discomfort, yes. pretty quickly is, are you having fevers? Are you having chills? Are you having low back pain? How do you feel? Do you feel sick? Sure. A simple urinary tract infection sure. is discomfort, but usually not feeling sick, usually not having well, I right. should say it, it would be not having systemic signs and, and symptoms. And besides that, as you mentioned before, you've got male and female construction differences in, mm -hmm. in anatomy mm -hmm. that could be uh, related to prostate, mm -hmm. right? And not urinary tract, necessarily. And that, or that could originated be, yeah. in the urinary tract, but moved to another place. Yeah, no, that could be a huge challenge. Um, um, not indeed. only is it a challenge in the diagnosis, but it's a different therapy. Right. If you treat someone for just a week or two, yeah. and they have infection in the prostate, um, you're gonna get a lot of failures. You're gonna get a lot of people who come back and require more prolonged therapy. Yeah. So this, I think this is part of why I like urinary tract infections so much, because there is a complexity <laughs> here. There is a challenge to, to getting it right. right. Um, so when we get to the diagnosis, we've talked a little bit about distinguishing your clinical symptoms, cystitis versus an upper or pyelonephritis. Um, but when we get to the diagnosis, I think we get back to the same thing. The urinary discomfort alone with a negative dipstick, that is not a urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. And you really don't want to treat those people. You want to withhold those life-saving antibiotics, as we say. <laughs> uh, because what we're seeing in a lot of parts of the world is by overuse, we now run into issues where sure. so many of the bacteria are resistant to our antibiotics. That's so you want right. a consistent clinical scenario, and then you want at least a minimum amount of laboratory confirmation. So it's gonna be pretty hard, I think, to approach people with potential urinary tract infections if you don't have at least the ability to do a urine dipstick. So are there uh, groups of people that develop urinary tract infections more chronically than other groups, like um, people who work in the field, you were mentioning people mm -hmm. who do a lot of physical labor, who don't drink a lot, who are also uh, forced to um, get rid of their waste products, both solid and liquids, in mm -hmm. the natural world, so to speak, and maybe run into some contamination problems with their hands as well, because the lack of sanitation is there. So yes, the, the people who are high, at highest risk for urinary tract infections, one is uh, females versus males, more urinary tract infections in females. Um, certain individuals have a higher incidence. There might be certain women who three times a year have a urinary tract infection. Three times three a year. Three times a year, and that might be normal for them. Wow. Um, there's a certain rate at which physicians, clinicians might intervene when it becomes recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, hydration is a huge um, impact on, um, has a huge impact on who gets urinary tract infections. Right. People who drink less, not only are they at risk at kidney stones, but they're also at more risk of urinary tract infections. Um, hygiene is an issue, um, and this becomes more of an issue in, let's say, the elderly or people who have cognitive impairment. There may be an issue cleaning themselves. Right. Um, where they may be wiping in the wrong direction because a lot of the urinary tract pathogens are originally coming um, from the feces. Got it. So if you're not cleaning yourself, if you're not cleaning your hands, if you're right. not wiping or cleaning properly, it's too short a distance, unfortunately, between where the feces comes out, Understood. where the urine comes out, 
and particularly in a woman, it's a very short distance between the outside world and the inside of the bladder where the infections can... Um, yeah, that's a lot to think about. So I want to go back, actually, to something you brought up about our sterile fluids. Right. And I Let's think this is, this is something that complicates urinary tract infections yeah. and is a reason for overtreatment. Uh, and we've actually we've coined terminology, which I think, once we have a name for something, I feel like it's the fantasy <laughs> now, we, now we know what to do because we've named it. Right. But they've um, created the terminology of asymptomatic bacteria. And this is the reality that, like you brought up, Dixon, there is, urine is not sterile. Nope. There's always bacteria. Yep. And other pathogens in there. There's That's always right. microorganisms in there. But there's a threshold at which we move from tolerating it to it being yeah. benign That's colonization, right. Right. asymptomatic bacteria, and then moving into an actual infection. Yes. Um, we used to think that that was a line in the sand. We used to use greater than 100,000. Unfortunately, the wave came in and washed that one away. <laughs> it did. I know, that's a great thing about lines in the sand. It's gone. It's totally it's, gone. And that's a good thing, I think, about teaching is lines in the sand are not. That's right. I, I can often remember hearing the term clean catch when they advised women on how to bring a urine sample in to make sure it's not something else. And a clean catch, there's no such thing as a clean catch, basically. It's like safer sex. It's cleaner catch. You're not going to do it without cleaner. Yeah, cleaner. That's right. That's right. Um, and so we used to use. We used to think we could use the bacterial count to determine whether there was an infection or not. We realized that's no longer true, and that's the great thing about the <clears throat> asymptomatic bacteria. You can have greater than a hundred thousand colony forming units per milliliter. So, colony forming units per milliliter. And the person can be completely asymptomatic. Wow. And treatment does nothing helpful. Wow. It does harmful things, the risk of antibiotic right. issues, the risk of resistance. It alters the normal microbiome it and throws opens off. the door for lots of visitors that we don't want. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's important that we're not treating asymptomatic bacteria. It's important that we're actually treating people when they have urinary tract infections and not just giving them antibiotics to. Right treat discomfort, which could be due to yep. many other things. So let's talk about treatment. So let's say, let's say we dot all our eyes. So they've got the urinary discomfort. They've got a positive dipstick. Yep. Um, after a while, um, particularly say women who often have a lot of, they'll know after a while. And a lot of times clinicians will treat them because they'll, what they say is a reliable clinical picture. When possible, try to confirm. You really don't want to fall into that oh, but we're going into a holiday weekend right? <laughs> or clinic. You know, we have the holiday season is upon us. And so the clinic will be closed for the next three days. You really want to try to yeah. avoid over treatment. Yeah, As yeah, mentioned, yeah. many of these will get better on their own. It's true. Um, something most people don't have, but when you have it is fantastic, is the ability to actually get a urine culture to actually wow. know what specific bacteria is causing the urinary tract infection. And you know, when you're looking at limited resources, if that's a resource level you can get up to, you can get urinary cultures. That can be super helpful, not just for the individual, but for the area because of the increasing resistance rates. In the United States, ciprofloxacin, which was a very common cornerstone in the, in the New York area, I would say a third to almost half of the common urinary isolates wow. are resistant. So that is no longer very helpful. Um, in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, there's been enough of the sulfur drug use that many of the common urinary pathogens are resistant to the sulfur medications. Wow. Um, so when wow. you can, either on your individual, on your population, or if you can get data from the health ministry, it really guides your choices of antibiotics should you want to use them for the individual mm -hmm. to treat. But where would you find that information? So in um, many places, the hospitals keep track. Okay. In many countries, the government will keep a list. The, the health ministries will often have guidelines on which antibiotics they recommend based upon regional resistance patterns. Um, so there's, there's a lot of information. Again, making treat, treating what seems so simple, a simple urinary tract infection, um, much more complicated. Right. Is there a network of physicians that keeps updating the information and maybe you can go to that so network? Whenever you're thinking about um, 
either practicing in your area or you're going to a new area, you want to look at the ministry guidelines if you can. Sure. Um, World Health Organization has great guidelines. They're up to date. Um, we have some what I'll call is um, basic recommendations that are starter points um, that those of you who are watching will see now come up. Um, but those of you who um, are listening, you can look in our book. But I'll say a couple of the things that have come up is um, we've started using more amoxicillin. Um, going back to that, higher dose amoxicillin um, is still quite effective uh, because we can get high enough doses to help push people towards cure. Um, for a simple cystitis, we're usually only treating for about three days. We're moving away from ciprofloxacin and the sulfa meds in a lot of parts of the world. Um, but again, I think this reminds me of a lecture we did on pain. There's going to be a certain number of individuals that have more serious infections. Sure. Hyalonephritis. Sure, of course, of course. They may have fever, they may have vomiting, yeah. they may be beyond um, what can be treated in just a simple three days oral. Um, and for some of these people, we'll actually recommend either ciprofloxacin or an intramuscular or intravenous ceftriaxone or some of the other medicines that we list. Got it. Um, and in those cases, you're going to treat a bit longer. And the duration is going to depend upon the choice of agent. Right. Ciprofloxacin um, might be five days of twice a day, where your ceftriaxone or some of your cephalosporins, you may treat for 10 to 14 days. But again, I think as we always try to bring up, if the person is too ill, if they're beyond um, the resources of your clinic, yeah, know yes. your regional referral. Right. Um, options. That's right. That's right. And if it's something more complex, your your favorite complication of urinary tract infections is prostatitis. Prostatitis. Again, that's not a simple urinary tract infection. That's going to require no, a not. longer treatment course and a selection of antibiotics that better penetrate the prostate. Personal experience. <laughs> Guilty as charged. And you have to be perseverant. You can't uh, abandon the therapy just because you start to feel better or the symptoms abate or the signs abate. You have to follow the instructions to the letter in order to make sure that works. And that's, I think it's very difficult when you're dealing with indigenous uh, situations where it's rural medicine, it's in a, a foreign country to begin with, we have limited resources. These are very challenging issues to deal with, I think. No, and I, I'm glad you sort of will finish on that note, but it used to be in infectious disease that we had different durations. We used to treat pneumonia for three weeks. We now know that's much too long. Ah. Um, but the durations, particularly for urinary tract infections, these are well studied. Okay. And so if you want to get a higher than 90% cure rate, if you want to get better, you want to take the full duration of treatment that's you recommended. Bet. You bet. If you stop when you're starting to feel better, not only might the infection come back, but you're setting up a scenario for resistance and yeah. failure of that antibiotic to work in That's the future. The, those are complicated issues that require good conversations between doctors and patients and health caregivers of all kinds also. Great. All right. Good. Well, thank you for joining us again for Indeed. another talk. Yep. We'll be back. <laughs>